Cleaner Media's Mining Weekly is speaking to Neil Pretorius, the CEO of DRD Gold. Neil, what is the main message you'd like to put across today? Martin, I think the big win for us this year is the fact that we, we built this 60 megawatt solar farm, uh, which is good for us f uh, from a number of perspectives, environmentally obviously, uh, we're halving Ergo's carbon footprint, but we also have, and then my colleagues will reprimand me for what I'm about to say, but we also have a, a 3 billion rand prepaid facility now in terms of electricity that will take care of about half of Ergo's requirements over the, the foreseeable future. Um, but in addition to that, uh, a lot of effort went into, into repositioning Ergo for the future. We'd always spoken about Far West Gold Phase 2, uh, the expansion of Far West Gold by building this large tailings facility, and, and we'll talk about that doubling the size of its plant, but, but Ergo, when we started 28, uh, 2008 rather, 2009, it was going to be a 12-year uh, project, 227 million tons uh, of, uh, of tailings, of resource. We mined through that, uh, but we realized towards 2018, 2019 that there's still a lot of life left in Ergo. We've got this fantastic infrastructure, we've got the plant, network of, of access routes and so forth. We'd added to the resource base and it was now a matter of, of setting it up for the future to, to try and extend that life by maybe a similar period. And, and that's really what, what we had done over the last 12 to 18 months, was systematically replace all of the old core sites that had become depleted, that, that formed the nucleus of the Ergo Life of Mine plan years ago. They, they'd all been mined out. And, and they had to be replaced in order to set Ergo up for that next phase. They've been replaced not as seamlessly as we had hoped. Uh, we spoke about some of the delays that we experienced, but they're all up and running now. And now it's a case of, of resetting Ergo over the next two to three years. Uh, we talk about Vision 28, so our, our target date, the, 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 the flag in the calendar, or the pin in the calendar is 1 July 2027. We want to be in a position where Ergo is now extended or expanded its, its deposition capacity uh, where it can receive all of these additional tailings and um, the, the, the network's been re-established and, and it can go, go back to 1.8 million tons per month. So, so, so th that's really what we had done in the last year or so in order to set Ergo up. Of course, a, a, big, um, a big highlight for us, uh, a big uh, marker in terms of timeline and execution and, and so forth, has been the fact that we got the go-ahead to start construction at the RTSF, that's the large regional tailings facility in the Far West Rand, part of uh, Far West uh, Gold operations. Uh, that started, we had the groundbreaking ceremony on the 5th of June and, and that's going along a pace. The design for the uh, refurbishment or the upgrading of that plant, that's also taken place. And they'll be working towards the same timeline. So the message today, I suppose, is Vision 28 and, and how we're setting ourselves up for that. Additional 14 years at Ergo and 25 years at Far West Gold of operation. And will that be at the same sort of level of volume? Because we've got value now. Uh, is the volume going to stay the same or do these expansions lift your volume? No, it, it does lift the volume quite a bit. Um, we're looking at 3 million tons a month of throughput from financial uh, 28 onwards. And it's also lifting gold production by about a ton. You'll see that in our guidance. Uh, we're guiding roughly five tons uh, per year for the, the next uh, period until we get to financial 28. And from financial 28, uh, that target is, uh, is just over six tons. Um, and, and the big part of that would be the, the doubling of the size at, at Far West Gold. So Ergo would see a reduction in, uh, in output. Uh, there'll be about a 600 kilo reduction in output at Ergo but that's more than made up at, uh, at Far West, which, which would basically see a doubling at its output. So uh, it should settle at about six tons, um, based on current assumptions with regards to throughput and recovery. Um, and, um, and, and then, as I say, it, it, it should be well set up for the, for the next decade or so. I mean, blessed with this great record gold price. What is driving that gold price? And do you think it is just short term, or is it medium term or long term, the gold price? Uh, Martin, up until a few years ago when, when the West, uh, the United States and, and Europe and, and the United Kingdom, when they lost interest in gold or lost confidence in gold, and look, they'd always used it sort of as a, uh, as a, uh, uh, a hedge for, for uncertainty. 
Uh, there, there was nothing catching the gold price, but I think in recent times of, of another second dynamic, global dynamic, uh, that started taking shape, and, and that was accumulation of gold in the East, China and uh, other Asian countries systematically have been increasing their gold inventory. And um, I once heard the, uh, the, the term gold rebased, and it, it certainly we, we saw it rebasing at a, at a higher level. Um, about a year, year and a half ago, we saw it bouncing off $1,700 and then $1,800. And, and now, I think with, uh, uh, with the, uh, the, the, the dynamics of the US economy um, and the slowing of, of, of inflation or, or the rather the, the lowering of interest rates and so forth, there might be some sort of return back to gold, and which is now, I would imagine, complementing this dynamic that we saw in the East. We, we, we don't really see I mean, there, there's so many theories, uh, China wanting to de-dollarize and so forth. Um, if that's really what they want, the amount of gold that they hold, they say they hold relative to, to total currency and issue, is still negligible. So if that's really their, you know, their goal, their focus, they're going to have to buy a lot more gold in order to, to really have a meaningful supply of gold to, to start sort of um, uh, uh, changing the shape of, of, of their foreign currency holdings. But uh, so, so we're hoping that that would continue. The uh, the West is overborrowed. There's a lot of fake money that that's gone into into the, the, those economies. And, and if I say, well, not really fake money, but but money that exists for no other reason other than a central bank saying, here's some more money. You know, it's not money that was that was generated. It's not capital growth or anything like that. It's just a central government providing a, an additional supply of of, of printed currency. Um, so. Um, you know, there that dynamic is, is changing. Um, their gold holdings relative to the to, to the currency in issue is, is, is inverse to to that which you see in uh, happening in the East. So it does seem as though those dynamics are, are still fairly fairly robust uh, from a gold price point of view. We, we're not really planning for a higher gold price. I mean, it is said that the gold price should go a little bit higher. I don't know how much of that would be sentiment driven, and how much of that would be based on fundamentals, but. Um, uh, if, if it doesn't go much lower than, than what it is now, then, then we're in good shape. Then we can fund all of these ambitious plans that we have for, for setting up the business for the future. And, you know, being clean and green, you're sort of at a halfway point there. Will you go to the full extent and how important is it for gold production to be green? Well, it's, it's something that's definitely becoming more and more important. You know, the, the amount of, if, if you look at the total... Um, value of, of investment globally. And if you look at gold as a percentage of that, it, it's negligible. It's just so small. Uh, so, so they're a pool of investors and they play in the gold space and so forth. But um, institutional investors uh, in, in the West in particular, in the West in particular, they don't really buy gold. It's, 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 it's all retail. It's uh, to a large extent. It's, it's spec either speculative or it's individuals uh, just shoring up against inflation and so forth. Uh, so, so if gold becomes a little bit more appealing, uh, also to institutional investors, um, if, if it's if it's categorised as a, a qualified liquid asset, for example, and banks don't have to to provide capital cover uh, to the extent that they take exposure to gold, um, you know, appetite for gold should should grow even further, um, because I think everything else is just so so empty, <laughs> if you know what I mean. So, so we do we do believe that. Uh, in terms of just fundamentally the constructive investment globally, the, world that the, the work that the World Gold Council is doing to, to make gold more appealing and, 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 and from a regulatory perspective uh, less complex to, to invest in, th there should be a lot more space for, for gold to expand even further and appetite for, for gold should increase as well. At this stage it's accumulation in, in the East and, and consumption in India. I think there are big drivers of the gold price. Um, Fear and uncertainty in the West have been key drivers. Um, the fact that you know certain certain jurisdictions find themselves in a position where they no longer have real currency, so they they have to or uh, they can't really trade, so they have to revert back to gold. Russia, for example, I think there's quite a bit of you know gold being used as currency. But um, you made the point, gold and oil. So if that dynamic changes in the West, if if it does become more of a um, an investment instrument also for institutional investors. And the sky's the limit. There, there could be enormous appetite for gold. And the 
technology that you're using now, uh, is it conventional technology that will continue in this form or do you see visions for bringing in new technology that could make sure that your margins are bigger? Well, the, 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 the technology that we're still using and the technology that we're planning to use going forward, um, yeah, the, the, that'll stay the same. Um, it's just a ma matter of the, the extent to which you, you can manage the different dynamics that impact on, on your recovery efficiency. And, 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 and that's a case of, uh, uh, of, of, of the kind of controls that you have in place, your operational controls that you have in place and how you monitor um, and, and manage those. And, and a lot of what we do um, is monitored digitally. So, um, you know, we, uh, I think we spoke about a while back of how we'd introduced a, an information management system and that, that the system tracks the, the key dynamics, the, uh, the non-negotiables we call them, about eight or nine different dynamics. And, and how by looking at these and tracking these on a 24-7 basis, uh, you increasingly start to understand the, the interaction between these different dynamics and, and you're managing it towards a range, so you proactively manage your plant towards a range. Remember, we, we put two million tons of material into a, a plant and, and we take out 180, 200 parts per billion. So, so it's, it's macro volume and, 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 and nano sort of extraction. Uh, and we'll continue doing that, but, but there's, always, you know, there, there's always a smart guy somewhere coming up with something entirely new. There, there was the uh, doctoral thesis in Stellenbosch recently, and we, we actually had a, had a chat with a gentleman who whose master's thesis was upgraded to a doctoral thesis um, on, on what he saw and, and where he thought that this additional gold might be and, and it is where we suspected it might be but the technology at this stage in terms of high volume throughput and sort of at the scale that we're doing is just not there but if the gold's there we'll find the technology at some stage. You know we, we're moving a lot of material from one place to another and, and we're stacking it very neatly and, and in terms of more contemporary standards nowadays, our tailings facilities, but we're only taking out about 50% of, of the gold that, that's in the material. And, and that's, what we, that's what we know of, that's, that's what we see. It's not the, the soluble gold or colloidal gold as, the, as it's referred to. Um, so, so there might be technology for that as well. Not in my lifetime, Martin, but in the next generation. We'll, we'll stack it for them, we'll stockpile it for them, all seven, 800 million tons, and then they can have another go at it in 20 or 30 years from now. And you're going to the Denver Gold Conference. Do you go there as DRD Gold or do you go there as World Gold Council representative? And will you be presenting there? What do you hope to get out of the Denver Gold? Yes, look, a, a, a big part of going back to Denver, uh, and it's the first time in, in probably eight, nine years that we go back to Denver, is uh, the, the size of the company in terms of market capitalization and, and output. It's changed a little bit. Uh, so we, we might be a tiny bit more relevant at the Denver Gold Conference now than what we were many, many years ago. I think we went from a, let's say, a hundred to hundred and fifty million dollar company to an eight hundred to a billion dollar company. Um, I think we took a peak over a billion dollars last year, and, and hopefully with the gold price where it is, and you know, and as much as the market might might become a little bit more comfortable with where we're going, we, we might go back there again. I think we're hovering around eight hundred and fifty million dollars now. So so that's the sort of size that that uh, that would justify the expense of going to Denver and, and talking to the investors who, who do go to Denver. Um, but the World Gold Council is also a big part of that. You know, there are a lot of interesting initiatives that they're working with, with regards to standardization of, of standards and so forth. Uh, I'm very excited about the work, work that they're doing uh, in terms of the, the, the uh, investability of gold, also to, to start penetrating the institutional market in that regard. So it's good company to be in, um, and it's, it's as much a reason for being there than, than going to the Denver conference itself. And you think we're far away from institutional gold? Do you think that uh, there's an acceptance building up, especially with the gold price the way it is? Uh, Martin, it's, it's, it's hard to say. Uh, you know, institutional investors go where they will find the best return for, for the, in proportion to, to the risk exposure that they take. And, they, and in the United States in particular, the, the, the volumes that are being traded uh, are stupendous. So you could take fractional margins uh, on, uh, on, on any sort of instrument and, and you could have large returns. So I suppose it depends on, on what the portfolio mandate is, but, but if it's both uh, capital preservation, uh, maintaining purchase parity over time, the, the influence of the dollar is, is so profound that it, it's going to be many, many years, I believe, before you see a real change sort of in reserve currency 
sentiment and so forth. But uh, as long as there's a certain part of the world that believe it's worth having a go at the dollar and de-dollarizing and sort of changing the balance in terms of, of uh, international trade, it's as good a sentiment as any other sentiment that's driving any other investment instrument on, on the New York Stock Exchange for that matter. And investors will go where the money is. I think it's, it's a case of just Firstly, provenance. Uh, nobody wants to buy something that was dug out uh, in, in a way that is just uh, socially unacceptable. Uh, nobody really wants to be involved in, in destroying nature anymore. You, you, no, nobody's going to buy your stock and, and sort of turn a blind eye to the fact that, you, that you're uh, leaving you know, smoking holes all over the place. Um, so, uh, so I think if, if the industry fixes those things and uh, if the if provenance is, is, is established, uh, origin is established, and you can in good conscience buy gold, um, knowing that it's not at the cost of, of something which is socially unacceptable, um, then appetite for gold should increase. And just on the environmental protection side, just the very nature of your business is an environmental rehabilitation type approach. And is this recognize that you are really protecting the environment, bringing it back to what it was, is it sufficiently recognized, do you think? Well, Martin, uh, I think what we're looking for is not so much, you know, applause. Um, the fact is this is the way that it's supposed to be. What we're hoping is this, that we'll increasingly become the industry standard. That you not only restore nature, and that part which you can't restore, you take to a point where it could be made available for sustainable land use, but you also start looking at what sort of ecosystem you leave behind. Um, and, and that's something that I find particularly exciting. You know, we, obviously a big part of our business is cleaning up sites and, and removing stored waste from, from where it was stored 10, 15, 20, 100 years ago. Those sites, in as much as uh, it, it's in, in a wetland or an area not fit for, for use, uh, for residential or industrial use, Nature is restored, and, and there's actually quite a lot of work in that regard happening to the south of Johannesburg along, along the uh, along the spray that, that runs along uh, sort of the Crown Old Crown area, uh, and, and, and that that, that spray is going to be rehabilitated and restored to its former glory in, in 10, 15 years from now. It's systematically being cleaned up. But something that I find fascinating is is the work that's been happening on our large touring, uh, storage facility, the tailings facility out in, in Brackpan, which, which is the one that's now reaching the end of its life as well. It's a big part of our focus going forward is to add uh, additional storage space. But we've cleared it that the side of that dam, and it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a tall dam and it's several hundred hectares in size. We've cleared it the sides of that dam with uh, natural soil. And because it's natural soil, the natural vegetation came back. And insects, birds, small animals, all they see is natural vegetation. So they say, hey, natural ecosystem. And it's amazing to see what's come back. So, so that, that part I find extremely exciting. And, and that should be the industry standard. You know, years ago, we sort of some, somewhat ambitiously started using terminology like, like be the benchmark. Um, set the standard and be the benchmark. And, and I honestly believe that, that some of the work that's happening in that regard could in fact be an aspirational benchmark for the industry going forward. And finally, Neil, could you give us an insight into how the host communities are benefiting from DRD Gold's activities? Not, not as much as we, as we would want, obviously, because all of these things ought to be a collaboration. Um, you know, we, we do point out to host communities that although we pay several hundred million rands in, in taxes every year, we don't see much evidence that a lot of those taxes find their way back into those communities and that's a conversation that we're having. But with the size of footprint that we have, Martin, a lot of our focus is on assisting communities to self-empower and to become self-sustainable. The poorest of the poor live in close proximity to where we have our facilities and um, the, the, the only way that those communities will ultimately develop out of poverty, abject poverty, is really through, uh, through their own efforts. But, but they need to be equipped. And, and what we're trying to do is equipping them for uh, the informal economy. So there are five pillars of, of focus, uh, work that we've done with the University of Pretoria. They've assisted us to, to design some of these uh, projects and we're systematically rolling those out. And um, they, they're knowledge-based, so you come and attend 
some of our workshops and, and we equip you with knowledge. In some, some instances, there's, there's a little bit of capital involved as well. And, and that then equips you, we believe, with, with the life skills uh, and the knowledge to either start a small business or to improve your own knowledge base and, and, and become a source of, of knowledge for other people. And hopefully, systematically, as I say, those communities would sort of trade themselves out of the situation that they're in. And uh, we, we're seeing some of that happening. Uh, the, the program kicked off uh, with a target audience of about, I think it was 500. I think we passed 8,000 already of people that actually been exposed to this knowledge uh, package and, and many, many hundreds of them have in fact implemented and, and, and are going forward on that. The, the empowerment of the informal economy, the activation of the informal economy, I, th I believe is really going to be the catalyst for, for South Africa um, of, of turning around this the cycle of, of, of increased uh, poverty. That was Creamer Media's Mining Weekly speaking to Neil Pretorius, the CEO of DRD Gold.